the day. Uh, let's start with China, Minister, first of all, because things are getting, you know, going from bad to worse. I, we did note a shift in tone from the federal government, though, with Simon Birmingham saying that the fact that there have been various actions, the cumulative effect gives rise to the perception these actions are being undertaken in response to some other factors. Has the government basically decided to call this for what it is in terms of being coercion here? Well, look, we took it on face value, the actions in which uh, China uh, implemented against barley, uh, uh, timber, and now what, but now wine. Uh, but subsequent, they've made statements, uh, assertions, uh, and grievances around some of the actions, sovereign actions of our country. Uh, now, that obviously leads to the perception, uh, quite rightly, that uh, the actions that they're taking against our commodities is more around their grievances around our sovereignty and, and our sovereign actions than it is around anything to do with trade. Uh, so it's important now for Chinese officials to quite clearly articulate and demonstrate uh, that that is not the case. We are a, a rules-based trading nation and we expect those that we trade with do the same, not only through individual trade agreements, but also just through the WTO. So it's important that uh, China is very clear on this. Australia has been open and transparent and we expect the Chinese to do exactly the same. But the evidence and the actions uh, that uh, are mounting uh, tend to indicate it's more a grievance around our sovereign actions rather than trading actions. Given we, we just signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, this uh, RCEP as it's called, China signed it as well. What good is it if it doesn't help protect us and our wine exporters from action like this? Well, it sets in place a process, as does our trade agreements. And that's the thing, is we're not going to throw our toys out of the cot and, and, uh, and not be uh, a leading nation in terms of protocols for trade, because if you, if you move away from that, then it becomes disorderly uh, and anything goes. Uh, there's set procedures that, that we'll now follow and we respect that. Uh, but we expect those nations to act fairly. And if they don't, we'll go to the umpire. We'll work with industry around making sure we get that right. And the timing of that, whether it be on, uh, whether it be on wine or barley, uh, we'll continue to work with those industries around what that'll look like. But you, you just can't have um, be part of a rules-based system and then say you're not going to adhere to those rules. And that's what we're saying is we'll now take the next step under these procedures and, and these rules. We respect that. We're a good trading nation, a fair trading nation and we'll continue to be predicating our actions on the rules-based um, basis of trade. Given the wine tariffs and concerns over coal imports, 80 ships off the coast apparently, in hindsight, could the government have handled this better? Um, you know, specifically with that initial call for an inquiry into COVID, would it have been better for the government to basically get it all its ducks lined up first, to get some other nations on board first so that we weren't standing out on, on our own on that issue? Well, I don't think we're standing out on our own. The fact that uh, Australia decided to lead the world and, and do the responsible thing. We're a good global citizen. The world's got a lot smaller and, and we have to understand that our lives are intertwined because of that uh, and therefore we have a responsibility to one another. There wasn't any mal malice in, in our request to look at this. It was a sensible request. Uh, I would have thought that after a pandemic where uh, so many lives have been touched, so that is a responsible thing uh, governments would do. And the fact that Australia decided to lead the world again on this matter, I think, um, doesn't really uh, go to the, to the facts uh, around this at all. That's the responsible thing any government should do. And the fact Australia led, I think we should be proud of that. Uh, we'll continue to work and, and make sure that uh, we have our our door open and our phone always on to, to those in China that may have grievances or misunderstandings about any of our actions. That's the best way to resolve it, is dialogue uh, and a rich dialogue rather uh, than closing it off. And that's what Australia will continue to do. We've led the world in trying to understand and learn better from this pandemic and we'll continue to try and uh, make sure that those nations that might have misunderstandings around that, that we uh, explain that to them. Isn't it all a bit predictable, though? The government, you know, as, as the, the Trade Minister, Finance Minister himself said, it's a cumulative impact. Has the government been a bit clunky in its diplomatic efforts, um, particularly in relation to China? Have the chest-beating, you know, uh, elements of the debate carried too much sway within the government? 
Well, I don't think uh, from ministers that there's been any chest beating. I think our language has been very considered. Uh, it's been around understanding. And in fact, it's been the Australian minister, trade minister and myself that have both reached out to try and uh, start dialogue around this. And that's the only way to resolve any misunderstandings or grievances is to have dialogue. But someone's got to lead that. And that's what we've done. We've said from the start uh, that if there are issues, the best way in which to deal with them is to have dialogue. And that's what we'll continue to do. But we won't compromise on our sovereignty or our values. Uh, we never will. And, and whether it be to China or any other country, Australia is its own sovereign nation. And as we respect other nations and their sovereignty, uh, we'll make our own decisions here in Australia around our sovereignty. But we want to be able to trade. I think trade is one way, is the most significant way, in which uh, there is global security uh, because I think there is vested interest from both sides if we're able to trade in, in a rules-based way. Well, we obviously feel for the, the wine exporters at the moment, and, but uh, if, if this starts getting towards threats to iron ore exports, that's when we're, the nation will really start getting nervous, won't we? Well, obviously, we've already started in terms of making sure that whether it be iron ore, coal, wine, um, barley, that we can send our commodity into other markets and we'll continue to do that. There are 14 free trade agreements. In fact, uh, trade uh, before we came into government was only covered by about 26% uh, for free trade agreements. Now it's over 70% of our trade is covered by free trade agreements. We're looking to, to get that to around 90%. So uh, we're, we're giving exporters the opportunity to spread their risk. That's a simple business principle we say to any exporter that they shouldn't you can't have market concentration. As a customer, can you? But, well, th those are the challenges that we'll work through and, and make sure that we work with the industry and, and we look to diversify markets as quickly as we can. And, and, and that's why we've already done a lot of the legwork and continue to do that around making sure there's opportunity uh, to send boats left and right uh, if, if there are challenges with one particular market. A few other issues now. A challenge for the fruit juice uh, industry. Our viewers might not have noticed this story, but it's a big one for fruit growers and producers. Basically, the Health Star rating for 100% no added sugar juices is being reduced. To how, how big an impact is, is that going to have on the industry? Well, this is just pure insanity. Uh, I mean, the states uh, and the Commonwealth and New Zealand government all come together under the Fazans, and that sets the, the food standards across the Australia and New Zealand, and we've created this Health Star rating system. What they're effectively saying is that they will give Diet Cola a three and a half Health Star rating, while 100% vegetable and fruit juice will get somewhere between two and two and a half health stars. Uh, it has no uh, nutritional value, Diet Cola, but I can tell you 100% vegetable and fruit juice does. This is just states and state ministers in particular are not having the courage to stand up to bureaucrats and using their own common sense and saying that just doesn't work. Uh, in fact, New South Wales and South Australia have to say supported, supported me in, in asking for a four-star health rating for 100% vegetable and, and uh, fruit juice. But the other states turn their back. Queensland, Victoria, Northern Territory, Western Australia, uh, they all turn their back on, on farmers. Uh, $67 million alone just to the citrus industry that this will do. But what it also does, Kieran, is undermines the health star rating system. Because common sense of Australians out there, when they go to the supermarket and they look at 100% fruit juice against a diet cola and they see higher stars for diet cola versus 100% fruit or vegetable juice, they're just going to say that, that those health star ratings mean absolutely nothing. So what the state ministers have effectively done is undermine their own system. Uh, but uh, sadly, this is going to cost primary producers, particularly particularly when we're just coming out of a drought and we're not out of it in some parts, but with some of these, this is the first bumper harvest we've had in some time. Mm. Citrus Australia is warning that producers will simply stop using the system, some of them that have lost faith in it. Well, and that goes to my point, is that it, what these actions of these state ministers are being led by the nose by their bureaucrats because they don't have the courage to stand up to them and say, get out. Um, they're effectively allowing them to lead an industry uh, into, into turmoil again and, and undermine the exact system that they're trying to promote and preserve. Um, this health star rating system could be used um, sensibly, but when you get politicians that don't have the courage to stand up to their
they're bureaucrats, yeah. then it undermines the whole system. And I don't blame, I don't blame Citrus Australia because they're the ones at the at the forefront of this that are going to hurt the most. The uh, let's uh, look at a, another issue that uh, we heard overnight. Home builder Andrew mentioned it earlier in the program. It's going to be extended. Is it likely that that support initiative will be in place right throughout next year? No, well, we've obviously just extended it. We'll, we're, all our measures have been targeted and temporary. Um, obviously, this is costing the Australian taxpayer around $900 million, but it's having a significant impact on getting us out of this COVID recession. Uh, we've seen a 20% increase in dwelling approvals uh, since we started this program. Uh, there's been 27,000 dwellings that have been approved under this and there's another 15,000 we anticipate under this. So this has been a significant uh, program around getting us out of this COVID recession, getting getting tradies moving and, you know, that, it's where they procure their materials from the local hardware store, so it flows through. Uh, and then what happens is the homeowner has capital and has equity uh, that they can also go and invest in other things within the economy. So this has been a real success story. Uh, we'll continue to, to monitor not only this program but others as we move through uh, the, the, the next year. But we've got to make people understand that all our measures have been temporary and targeted and our economy is starting to respond because of it. And I think um, we're probably standing better than any other nation in the world because of the levers sure. we pulled. We didn't waste our money on pink bats and school halls. We actually have put money in and programs into what will grow the economy, not just in building infrastructure, but operating. And that's creating jobs here and into the future. And that's really the, the levers that we've pulled as a government through this COVID recession. We have we haven't flitted it away on ideological uh, infrastructure that have no benefit into the future. Would you like to see that program broadened to en encompass social housing? That way you can have the economic benefit, uh, but you're also undertaking projects that otherwise won't be built. So that's a real stimulus. Plus you've got the social benefit of improving the social housing stock. Well, Kieran, that's the state government's responsibility. Um, they build social housing. In fact, I've got to congratulate the Victorian government. They've put $5 billion out with respect to that. The other states are doing three-fifths of bugger all, and it's time that they did their bit. And, in fact, even the RBA governor made it very clear that while the Australian government has spent around 16% of GDP, the states have only been spending around 2.5% of GSP. So uh, they haven't really been uh, doing any of the heavy lifting at all, and Victoria has finally said that they're going to do something and I've got to congratulate them and, and it's now up to the other states to follow them. Five billion dollars worth of, of social housing is important and that's the responsibility of the states. We've got to get back to our own knitting. Each state uh, and federal government shouldn't be overhanging into other, other jurisdictions responsibilities. This is where the states need to, to move away from this business model of blame Canberra and ask more money. They've simply got to live up to their responsibility. Victoria is and now it's time for the rest of the states to do their bit as well. You're the Minister for Emergency Management. Last summer was an absolute shocker. Uh, as we are broadcasting this morning, many Australians are feeling the heat wave that we're copping at the moment, met big in large parts of the country. How's this year shaping up in terms of the, the fire threat? And with La Nina, uh, that uh, system in place, so I guess the, the other risk, the flip side, is the floods and cyclones that we're likely to see. Yeah, Kieran, look, we've planned meticulously for the bushfire season again this year. And I, I've got to say, um, it's the fire commissioners from around the country that do that. Emergency Management Australia simply coordinates that on a national level. And we've some of the best fire commissioners in the world. Uh, the, the threat isn't as high as last year, uh, but there is still threat, particularly in western New South Wales, west of the divide. There's um, an updated, updated response that I saw only on Friday around this. Uh, there's parts of Queensland that we're still worried about and, and particularly particularly in Western Australia. And then there's also, even around Canberra, uh, the, the real threat of grass fires. And because of some of the early uh, spring rain we've had, it's created some fuel loads that we need to watch and monitor. But as you've just articulated, we've got to be prepared to pivot and pivot quickly into a La Nina. And so uh, that means that we're likely to see more cyclones, um, harsher cyclones, uh, and, and in fact, that'll lead obviously to flooding. So we need to make sure that we can pivot from bushfire into, into cyclone 
and flooding events, particularly in northern Australia. And that's all with the overlay of COVID-19. And so what we've done back in August yeah. was we sat down and we made sure that we had a COVID plan on top of that overlaid our bushfire and, and La Nina plans so that we can move emergency service personnel from one state to the other and keep them safe and the people that they're going to save safe. So we all have a responsibility. We've all got to prepare. It's not just state and federal governments that have to. Uh, homeowners can too. And if they need to have a plan to get out, and if one of those emergency service personnel tell them to get out, do it. Don't wait. These people are putting their lives on the line for you. And uh, finally, your neighbour uh, in the seat of Groom, the Groom by-election, the win uh, to Garth Hamilton, a thumping win, no surprise there. No, well, look, you never take anything for granted these days, but, uh, look, we're very happy to get Garth in after the retirement of John McVeigh. Garth's an engineer. Uh, he's built roads, rail, dams, even mining, uh, you know, that dirty word that the Labor Party won't talk about. Uh, so, you know, he's he comes with experience, practical experience, and that's what we want to bring to the Palmer, some diversity, and I think the people of Groom got it right, thank God, yesterday.